Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I hate to be the one to interrupt your lunch. Please, please don't shoot me. <laughs> continue on, continue on. We're ready to start um, the next segment of our program. I am Kristen Hodge Clark. I'm Director of Research for the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. <gasps> yes, that's a mouthful. Uh, we're better known as AGB. Uh, I'm also a member of the planning committee for this meeting, so it's, it's wonderful to see it all come to fruition and to see and listen to some of the amazing discussions that we've had already this morning. Um, other quick tidbit about myself is I am, as of July 1, one of the newest members of the College of St. Benedict's Board of Trustees, so I'm... <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of, of the campus community more formally now. Um, but I'd like, I love to introduce our lunch and keynote speaker with whom I've had the pleasure of partnering on a number of projects with AGB and, and Gallup. Um, Brandon Bastide is a senior partner at Gallup and global head of their public sector division. And that's hot off the presses. That's a brand new um, uh, title that he's assumed with Gallup. And so I'm ex extremely happy for him in this, in this role. I think it's just an expansion of what he's already done in the higher ed space. Um, he leads Gallup's work across higher education, government, and foundation and corporate social impact initiatives. Um, and his specific area of expertise in education and workforce development has, has definitely made him uh, a very sought after expert in this area. Um, what that means to you all um, today is a continuation of our great discussion from this morning around data. And so uh, many of the projects that he's led with Gallup um, uh, have been groundbreaking, uh, one of which includes the Gallup Purdue Index Report, um, the Strata Gallup Education Consumer Survey. Um, he's also done work with the Gallup Google Study of Computer Science in K-12 schools, among dozens of other projects. And so, uh, again, he is just uh, has a volume of work that he's led as part of Gallup. Um, in addition to his work with Gallup, he's also founded two companies and one nonprofit organization as a social entrepreneur. One of which um, is uh, where he was former CEO of CEO Outside of the Classroom, a company that pioneered adaptive online education and alcohol abuse prevention. Um, he's also an internationally known scholar and author of, of numerous publications uh, across Gallup News, the Chronicle of Higher Education, AGB's publication, Trusteeship Magazine. He's contributed numerous um, articles. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree in public policy from Duke University, um, as well as as a former trustee emeritus of Duke's Board of Trustees as well. Um, he lives in Vienna, Virginia with his wife and their two children, Annabelle and Harrison. So join me in welcoming Brandon to the stage. Thank you. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I know this is going to make some of you very uncomfortable. Um, but I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so that's how we're going to roll today. I'm really excited to be here, um, and I'm glad that I got to catch the last panel and uh, the breakout discussion was just before it, so I've missed other parts of it. But um, clearly, this is a gathering that's having an incredibly thoughtful and deep conversation. And, and boy, do we need more of those on a, a number of subjects in the country today. I was just commenting uh, at our table that, uh, so I live in Vienna, Virginia. Our, our headquarters are in Washington, DC. Uh, and I've lived in Washington now for the last six and a half years and uh, put aside the uh, transition of uh, administrations and some of the other things that have been very obvious major changes in Washington. You know, the thing that, that concerns me most about what's happening in Washington right now is that everybody in a role of power or influence in that town spends their days in 15 minute increments from the time they start their day to the time they end it they are literally going from different meeting different subject different constituency different whatever in 15 minute increments now i don't know how you ever get to deep meaningful anything when you are leading your life in 15 minute increments. Now, I say that about Washington, but that probably also resonates with a few of you in this room. When I think about the challenges that college administrators face, college presidents, by the way, probably spend a lot of their days in 15 minute or less increments. And so, uh, gosh, this is just a, a great conversation to be part of. Thank you for having me. 
I'm curious, how many of you uh, are, are, uh, are holders of a liberal arts degree? Raise your hands. I just want to see. Whoa. All right, almost everybody. Um, how many of you, by the way, I, I know that I, this sounds like a you know, cutesy kind of question, but I, I just seriously answered for me. How many of you have a bachelor's degree? You just raise your hand, put them up high, and hold them up. Now, let the record reflect that pretty much everybody's hand went up. Just pause on this point for a minute. 65% of the US adult population today doesn't have a bachelor's degree. That's still where we are. I mean, I know you've heard that stat before. But, but I always like to remind us of that as an anchoring and framing before we dive into our higher ed talk and the language that we use and right, it's all stuff that sounds familiar to us is that and I know you, know you all appreciate this to some degree, but right, we are operating in the context of a country where 65% of adults over age 18 still do not have a bachelor's degree. And you know, if you layer in associate's degree and other stuff, you don't, you don't boost it much beyond that, right? You get to like 40% in total degree attainment, 42 if you add in high quality credentials. Anyway, long story short is although we've made some great progress in college attainment, we are still talking about a majority of folks who don't have this thing that we're all talking about, that we're all talking about how we grow, how we defend, how we write, all these types of things. So I want to start there. Now, there's kind of four major points that I, I hope to convey today about the liberal arts. And I can certainly expand beyond the liberal arts and talk more, more broadly about higher education. There's certainly a lot of room that we go in there. And we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A because I've got about half my time balance between talk and, and the rest is going to be conversation. But the first one is, uh, and it's part of the title of the session, so this is not going to be a surprise for you, right, um, that, that we uh, probably need to think very carefully about the sales, marketing, and branding of this precious thing we call liberal arts. Now, I know already I've said three words that are probably not loved in the liberal arts community, right? But I'm going to use them because I think we need to start thinking about it in that way, this is a branding issue that we're facing right now. I do not believe, and I have evidence to support it, that this is about a reboot or a throw the liberal arts out equation. This is not a throw the baby out with the bathwater conversation, but I do think it's careful thought about how we might change the bathwater. Okay? So, and I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm trying a whole bunch of different analogies, so let's just see what <laughs> sticks here, all right? Uh, you guys can give me audience feedback by either booing or cheering or whatever. Um, oh, by the way, I'm a proud recipient of a liberal arts degree, too. I should have said that uh, coming out of the gates because um, part of what I'm going to say today is, is going to be provocative to liberal arts. And I, uh, I'm a certain, certainly a big believer in it and a personal uh, benefactor and recipient of it. But that's point number one, is that we've got a sales, marketing, and branding issue. Point number two is that this is not an either or. I think we have made a big mistake, and higher ed is very guilty of this, of painting this as an either or when it's a both and. What do I mean? I've been on so many panels and seen so many conferences where one of the sessions was a title like this, the liberal arts or careerism, dun, 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 right? The liberal arts or vocational training, the liberal arts or professional, like insert, right, the descriptor, but we have, we have created a very detrimental false dichotomy around those two things. Because if you think about, and I'll, I'll share some of this data, what it takes to be successful in work, any work, work in higher education, in the academy, work in a manufacturing or it doesn't matter, successful in any work, or to be thriving in your well-being, which is, which is something that Gallup's been studying for decades, not just in the US, but all around the world. It's a both and conversation. And I think we have created a silly and detrimental false dichotomy around either or. And we've also gotten ourselves into a pickle, I think, in certain ways, because we talk about one as better than the other. I mean, but think about it. We do. Well, you know, liberal arts is a higher order thinking. And it, right now, and so you've, you've, you've seen a dose of this stuff. So it's, it's not an either or, it's a both hand. The third point is the need to prove it is not going away. When I say prove it, to prove its value, to prove its ROI. This is not just 
the case for the liberal arts, it's the case for higher education right now writ large. The need to prove it is not going away and linked to that is a theme that came up on our panel before is having new and better data to prove it. Because our current data is necessary but also at the same time horribly insufficient in making that case. One example that we're really proud of at Gallup was the recent National Academy of Arts and Sciences report that came out, right? And inside Higher Ed's article uh, title was like, shocker, arts and humanities grads, you know, engaged in work and thriving in life. And <laughs> you all remember that article? It, I, I just talked to Scott Jassick and Doug Letterman about this the other day. It's, I think, the second or third most read article of the year on Inside Higher Ed which gives you an idea about how important the liberal arts is, right, in terms of people's interest in this stuff. But, but anyway, the, one, of the, one of the key data sets that that report was built off of was Gallup's research asking people about their jobs and their lives, their engagement in their work and their well-being. And those were some of the highlights of what buoyed the humanities in ways that they trail in others, like on income, right? You've seen that data. So yeah, slightly lower on earnings in some cases, but when it comes to workplace engagement, well-being, and some other things that are really important to our lives, the liberal arts looks pretty darn good. So I feel good that we're helping contribute in that way, but, but think about it. That's, a, that's very different stuff that we went out and measured, right, than, than we're typically measuring now. Uh, and so I do think we need to also be a little imaginative. It's not just knowing our data, but it's also being imaginative in what kinds of new data we can collect. And I'm going to come back to a couple of those examples. The fourth big point is, there is room for real improvement also. Okay, so as much as I am gonna lump a lot of the blame around the problem right now on a sales, marketing, and branding issue, which I think is largely the problem, let's just call that 85% of the problem, there's 15% or so that, that there, there is some real guidance from our research in terms of how we can improve the performance of the liberal arts, right? So those are, those are the four big points. Sales, marketing, and branding issue, not either or, both and. We have to prove it, and that's not going away. And there are real ways to improve. So let's just start off with this. And gosh, let me, I'll just be provocative. And some of you have read an article I wrote about this, right? The article was uh, Higher Ed Dropped the Term Liberal Arts. And I stand on that. I stand on it. I wrote the article several months ago. Um, I've had mostly positive feedback about it, mostly. And I try to be very clear in the article, again, that what I'm not suggesting is uh, that the liberal arts isn't valuable, right? That the fundamental pedagogy is broken. Not at all. It's as relevant as it's ever been. But I did say the term is a problem. So if you just think about it right now, if you were going to sit down with the best marketing minds in the world, or even if you just did this on your own campus with really bright people and said, what words could we use to turn people away in droves from what we have to sell and offer, what would we put together? You would put a couple words like liberal and arts in a package and call it liberal arts. It, I'm just going to say it. i got to be real honest. It's a branding disaster in today's context. Now, for reasons that we may not like to admit, okay, so one, people just don't understand it. They just don't understand it. One of the most powerful pieces of evidence of this comes from a Stanford School of Education study, which was of high-performing, low-income students in high school. And in open-ended interviews, they asked them, well, have you ever considered a liberal arts degree or liberal arts education? And these, again, open-ended, right, and coded them. The most common response was, what's that? That was number one. The second most common response was, I'm not liberal, as in political affiliation, okay? So although we all know that liberal in this sense, doesn't mean political. Sorry, it's kind of getting tied up in that. And the third most common response they had was either, I'm not good at or I'm not interested in art. OK, so, so you start there. And you say, of all the groups, and we've had this conversation about inclusivity, right? Of, of all, some of the groups that we want to attract most to the liberal arts, it would be high-performing, low-income students, which, of course, correlates a lot with underrepresented minority students. So you look at that, right? And then you test words and you do surveys. And so you survey parents of fifth through 12th graders, for example, to talk about kind of the, the influencers of the coming generation of traditional age college students. And you ask them, hey, 
uh, what do you think is the best path to a good job for your child? This was one of the questions we asked in this survey. And we gave them a whole list of options. And they actually rated a liberal arts degree below no college degree at all. Right, like some of this stuff is hard to believe, but then go back to where I started. 65% of the US population doesn't have a college degree. And most of them don't understand what a liberal arts degree is. They just don't. Now, when you start to describe the liberal arts, this is you know, where I hope I'm going to have uplifting points with some of these. Right? We're going we're to go up and down and all around. Uh, when you describe it, you go, well, what is the liberal arts? And you know, think of all the words used to describe it. You, critical thinking, skilled communication, collaboration, cultural understanding, right? I mean, well, all of a sudden now, your ears perk up. People go, oh, and certainly employers' ears perk up. You talk about the relevance of this in just, just this couple, past couple of months. LinkedIn came out with this huge report, which I hope you all saw, about all the jobs that are open in the US. And the, th the skills that are listed in those job descriptions, the most common skills are soft skills. Leadership, communication, and collaboration are the top three listed in open job descriptions. Those are suspiciously liberal arts. So the relevance of this is as high as it's ever been. And we are talking about something that indeed is the longest standing historical aspect of higher education. This goes back to ancient, Greece, ancient Greek history. Interestingly enough, the original design of the liberal arts included things, as many of you know, very practical things, dare I say, like serving in a jury and military training. In fact, military training was one of the biggest points of emphasis in the original version of a liberal education. So it's not that the liberal education has always been removed from practical application. It's actually the opposite. Its history and roots are grounded in very practical application. But for some reason, we've kind of distanced ourselves and the language we use around it from that idea, right? It's, it's the liberal arts or careerism, as if those two things can't go hand in hand. And gosh, you've heard and seen a couple books written, George Ander, a number of articles in Forbes, Fast Company, other places where there's this big dialogue among Silicon Valley CEOs who say their best coders are liberal arts majors, arts and humanities majors, right? Because they're divergent thinkers and creative. And yes, they still need the hard skill of coding. It's a both and, not an either or. This is a good one too. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, in our survey that we do with Inside Higher Education of College Admissions Officers, 8% of them, Jillian shared some of the stats of taking you know, top, top bar answers. These are a five point scale. Strongly agree to strongly disagree. 8% of college admissions directors strongly agree or agree. So you combine fours and fives, you get to 8%. That prospective students have a good understanding of what the liberal arts offers, right? So you know, here's college admissions officers going, yeah, no, they don't, they don't really have a clue what's going on. And these are the folks that have tinkered most with our marketing messages and our recruitment efforts and certain things like that. So anywhere you look in the data, right, it's just the words the words liberal and arts are things that are problematic and don't resonate. And of course, it's also linked to uh, my concerns about the recent souring on higher education among Republicans. And I'm not going to go too far down that. We've written a lot about it. But in essence, over the last couple of years, and this was before Trump administration shift, so that's important to note, there's been a real souring in confidence of higher education among Republicans. And when you, when you ask them open-ended questions like, well, if, for those who are negative, not all of them are negative, right? But if you're negative, why are you negative? Uh, top answer is, it's too liberal. And of course, see, they're thinking political liberal, but you put a word liberal in a title and you put that out there as your brand. And uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, I, I know that we, we, we all understand there's a difference here, but the words are just getting tied into things that are part of some of the concern and angst that's out there. Now, uh, so that's a little bit of the data around the brand. Uh, like I said, the LinkedIn examples are incredibly relevant examples of what's happening in terms of saying, yeah, geez, if we just use different words to describe this, the story starts to change a lot. So let me share some of the research about the power of liberal arts and also where it's lagging a little bit on certain indicators. And some of this is, is going to be very linked to uh, some of the research that, that Jillian has shared on high impact practices 
This is through the lens of the studies we've been doing of college graduates. And also uh, some recent data that we've done from currently enrolled college students. But so some of you will remember early findings from the Gallup-Purdue Index. We, we identified a handful of really critical experiences that graduates either had or didn't have that doubled their odds later in life of being engaged in their work, whatever that work is, and thriving in their overall well-being. We measure well-being in five dimensions, purpose well-being, social, financial, physical, and community. So it gets at a lot of the attributes, not perfectly, but it certainly gets at a lot of the attributes that we all believe in so deeply about the value of higher education and the value of liberal arts specifically. But you say, okay, uh, of these critical indicators, there's a handful that double your odds of hitting the mark on being engaged and thriving in your well-being. But what are they? Well, the three most important were, were what we put into a category called relationship-rich experiences. So think about your own undergraduate experience. These are five-point scales, strongly agree, strongly disagree. You strongly agree you had at least one professor who made you excited about learning. Right? That the professors at your alma mater cared about you as a person. And here was the strongest one, uh, and the least likely for graduates to hit. You had a mentor who encouraged your goals and dreams. Now, any of you who hit the mark on that, you instantly answered, strongly agree to that question. That person's name was in your head, right? I mean, it's just, you do cognitive interviews on that. No one ever sits there and debates that question. It's just like, definitely, Woody Greeno. That was my dad's answer. He's 77. He was one of my cognitive interviews. You don't forget those, right? But in any event, those three things turn out to be the most important in terms of their correlation with being engaged at work later in life and thriving your well-being. Guess what? Arts and humanities grads are the highest among all categories of majors on strongly agreeing to all three of those. Boom. There you go. The three most important elements we've identified in alumni outcome success on both a work and life dimension, arts and humanities grads are at the top of the list. Guess who's last, by the way, on those three indicators by, by major categories? Business majors. This is where you can make fun of business majors. It's OK. <laughs> Let it out. Let it out. Any business majors in the room? Don't raise your hand. OK. Now, there's different dimensions of this, OK? And this is one that I was actually surprised that arts and humanities majors weren't higher on. We asked a question about, this is the statement, I am deeply interested in the work I do. Pretty good question, I love it. Doesn't do bad, but social science and STEM majors are slightly ahead of arts and humanities majors in that. Again, business majors are last, if you just take the big categories that we looked at in these breaks. Uh, here's a good one. How about, uh, I have a good job waiting for me upon graduation. Graduates reporting they had a good job waiting for them upon graduation. Not going to surprise you, arts and humanities grads are last. Okay? Now, important to understand. Important to understand. The reason why I say it's important to understand is that the top reason why Americans value higher education, doesn't matter who you ask, college freshmen, parents, general population, currently enrolled students, graduates, right? The number one reason why Americans value higher education is to get a good job. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only reason we value it. The good news is we value it for many reasons. But at the top of the list, and by far at the top of the list, is that. So we have to own, we have to get the premise right, right? That's the premise in terms of all the different folks we're trying to attract and train and educate and grow and develop and lead. That's their number one goal. So it's kind of an important indicator to ask a question like, how long was it before you had a good job after you graduated, okay? Here's the interesting thing. Only 27% of graduates in the last 10 years 27% say they had a good job waiting for them upon graduation. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad or what, because honestly, no one's really ever tracked that kind of data. I mean, we have six-month destination surveys, right, where we go, did you get a job, yes or no? That's literally a question on, on most of the destination surveys. Now, that doesn't qualify whether that's a job that requires a college degree, whether it's a job that you feel is aligned with the kinds of things you were studying or worthy of your investment in higher education in terms of time and money. I mean, we just, we don't do a good job qualifying that. But anyway, here's where I go. Although arts and humanities grads are last on that, arts and humanities grads who had an internship during college where they applied what they were learning in the classroom doubles the likelihood that they have a good job waiting for them upon graduation. So you just said, Brandon, what's one magic wand 
that would double the percentage of arts and humanities graduates with a good job upon graduation. It's some sort of work integrated learning experience while they're in college. There's so many different ways that we can accomplish that. And by the way, it's not just about what the institution and individual faculty and staff are doing to increase the likelihood that happens for students. It's also about encouraging students to own that as part of their own educational experience to help them understand how important that kind of thing is. And if it's not mandatory or required as part of a program, how can it be encouraged? You get the idea. What's interesting on top of that is that for the arts and humanities grads who had an internship during college where they applied what they were learning, it puts them ahead, ahead of business, social science, and science majors on the likelihood of having a good job upon graduation for those who didn't have an internship in those categories. Okay, so this, see, here's a story. It starts to unwind a little bit. It's not just about the major that you had. It's importantly about the context with which you learn, which includes, in this case, a work integrated learning experience. So if you're an arts and humanities grad with an internship, you do better on job outcomes than business, science, and social science majors without an internship. Really important points to understand underneath the hood. Now, here's another one. We asked some questions that we just reported. This is about four weeks ago now. This is really fresh data uh, that we, we kind of categorized as, as relevance, for lack of a better description. So here were the statements we asked people about uh, in reflecting on their educational experience. We said, this is what the first statement was, the courses you took were directly relevant to the work you do. Pretty straightforward question. It, this, you know, the things you learned, the courses you took, are relevant to the work you do. Well. Theoretically, every liberal arts graduate should go definitely when they get that question, right? Theoretically, because they should have been prepared for any number of things, right? The other question we asked was more about a broader day-to-day -day life application. So we said the things you learned in college, uh, you use in your day-to-day -day life. So we kind of asked about relevance in two dimensions. Relates to your work, relates to your day-to-day -day life. Now here's one scary point. Only 26% only of college graduates in the United States strongly agree to both of those. Liberal arts grads are the lowest, but here's where it gets interesting. They're the lowest at the two-year degree level and the four-year degree level, but they're the second highest at the postgraduate level. Think about what that might mean. Liberal arts majors at a two-year level and a four-year level are the lowest on hitting the mark on those two relevance questions. But at the postgraduate level, they trail only STEM postgrads. If you think about postgrad, those who are majoring in the liberal arts or arts humanities at the postgraduate level, probably, presumably, most are going into academia or jobs that are aligned to that kind of study, right? I mean, it's kind of a more specific align. This is my theory behind it, but I'm interested in your reactions to it. So it's not true that liberal arts is low across the board. It's true at the two-year and four-year level on hitting the relevance mark. But it's real high at the post-grad level. So obviously, it can be accomplished. This isn't a story that's consistent across the board, just like the internship buoy is on jobs and, and important across every major. So really important things for us to think about there. Now, among currently enrolled college students, this is also a challenge. We ask currently enrolled college students uh, whether they think their major is going to lead to a good job. These are students currently enrolled. And uh, arts and humanities uh, majors are the lowest. And their likelihood that they... So currently enrolled students are already starting to, whether they're buying into a narrative, right? I don't know what it is, but, but they're, they're the lowest in thinking that their major is going to lead to a good job. So I've tried to sprinkle in here some real highlights, because, by the way, there are some real highlights about this, and also some of the areas that are part of the challenging narrative we have about the liberal arts. So where we go with this is, how do we prove and measure, right? And this is my example of that arts uh, and sciences study, where some of the highlight findings were, were measuring what I would call behavioral economic indicators. That's what Gallup would call it, right? Uh, subjective life evaluation. You start throwing fancy words in that doesn't resonate with anybody. It's like, do you like your life? Do you like your job? It's a good way to paraphrase that. 
Those are important measures, folks. And only you are the judge of that. Right? Like if I, if I say, do you like your job or not? Everybody knows how to answer that question, by the way. We ask it all kinds of ways. Everybody knows how to answer whether they like their job or love their job. Imagine this, actually. Just think about how you, you don't have to raise your hand or, or blurt it out. You've probably never been asked this question. I'm going to ask it to you. It's a really important one. One we do for well-being when we measure life evaluation around the world, the, the, the classic question that anchors that whole scale is, imagine your life on a ladder, zero to 10 rungs. 10 being the best imaginable life, zero being the worst imaginable. Where do you rate your life today? Just think about how you'd answer that. Well, you can ask that same thing about your job. Imagine your job on a scale, zero to 10 rungs. We just did this in a pilot study of jobs. Guess what percent of US adults give their job a 10? So you know unemployment's at like historical lows right now, and that sounds like good news, and generally that's good news. And guess what percent give their job a 10? 5%? Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Come on, man. Are we, that's, oh. We need some more optimism. You know, it's, it's higher than zero. It's higher than zero. <laughs> zero. Man. All right, I'm going I'm to try to be uplifting the rest of the day. I can tell I totally just brought the thing down. It's about 10%, which is about as rare as the, on the other end of the spectrum, let's say, the unemployment rate of roughly 4%. I mean, we're talking about rare percentages, low percentages here. But they matter, and everybody knows how to rate that about their life and about their job. And you can also ask them questions that get at their hope. So the other thing we do in, in measuring well-being is the next question we ask is, where do you think it'll be five years from now? So if you want to measure hope, you can just look at people who give a life evaluation now that's higher than the one they think they're going to have in five years. That's a real bad sign. Most people on the globe, thankfully, think their life is going to be better five years from now. But for people who go, yeah, I think I'm a seven now, and I think it's going to be a four. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Was that your rating? Come on. I, I told you not to reveal. You didn't have to raise your hand for this exercise. I, I don't want to be too long winded this. The point is, there are other things we can measure that I don't think we've worked very hard to measure that matter a lot in keeping score on this, and that do start to paint a much more powerful picture of the case for higher education, generally, and the case for arts and humanities or liberal arts. But let me just give you two examples of where we've totally fallen down. Critical thinking, we all say it's something we do. And every employer I've ever talked to says it's something they want. And we all rush to agree on a short list of things that that's what we want from people, critical thinkers. But when we do focus groups, and then we start to go around the table and you go, okay, wh what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? And people either start to write down or, or, or describe what they mean by critical. And guess what? You start to hear all kinds of different, unique variations of that. So I think we've rushed to agree all over. We want critical thinkers. And we haven't carefully defined what we mean by that. Because I'll give you one hint. When we do this with business audiences, you know, and, and thinking about, our college graduates ready for work and all that stuff. And, they, and we ask them about critical thinking. They say, yeah, yeah, we want critical thinkers. We go, what do you mean? They start to describe things like what I would call creative thinking. It's a little different. Original thought. A little different, right? Now, these things are all part of a, I think, you know, the umbrella. They, they fall under the umbrella of thinking. <laughs> Big thought I'm laying on y'all. <laughs> but there are different variants to it. You just think about the difference between uh, definition of convergent thinking versus divergent thinking as an example. You know, convergent thinking is applying a fixed set of rules to arriving at a single correct answer to a problem. I actually think our schools are doing a pretty good job on convergent thinking. Divergent thinking is a different animal though. It's a free flowing process of arriving at a number of potential solutions to a problem. See the difference all of a sudden? Now, there's practical applications all over the world of both convergent and divergent thinking. So I'm not saying one is better than the other, but they're different. And it's true that some people are better divergent thinkers than others, or better convergent thinkers than others. And if you're a Malcolm Gladwell fan, I think this is one of the examples he wrote about in his book, but the, you know, there's, there's tests for divergent thinkers. And one of the examples is like, 
tell me all the uses for a brick, open-ended. You just write down as many examples as you can think of for a brick. And the average person writes down like four or five things, right? Sidewalk, build a house. Divergent thinkers will write down over 70 different uses of a brick. And there's evidence that younger people are better divergent thinkers than older people. So with age, we actually lose our divergent thinking, and there's evidence that actually gets taught out of us. So I use my son, he's seven now, but when he was four, I did this little experiment at dinner. I said, Harrison, tell me all the different uses of a brick. He's a four-year-old, keep in mind. He went on for an hour. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We, he went on for an hour, and he was throwing out crazy shit. Like, I mean, sorry, excuse my French. You could grind it down into a powder and make toothpaste out of it. What? I mean, I was like, that's actually a pretty good idea. I'm like, I wonder if you could do that. You know, because of course the olive oil weed isn't olive oil, so I think make toothpaste out of brick, right? Why not? He went on for an hour because he was four, not because he's special or bright or brilliant, because he's four. Because he hasn't yet gotten to school where a teacher goes, that's a crazy idea, Harrison. Whoever told you that a brick could be smashed into powder and made into toothpaste? My dad. <laughs> My point is, I think we need to do a better job defining what we mean by these things, right? And then doing our best job, although it's not easy, to measure it. Here's the other one that I'll give you as another example. So critical thing is the first one. The second one is lifelong learning. It turns out that phrase is the most commonly used phrase in college mission statements. We've done this analysis, talk about like nerdy stuff we do at Gallup. I had the team ingest a thousand college mission statements of college universities, do a big word cloud kind of thing. Most commonly used phrase, lifelong learning. And now the question I submit to all of you is, how are you measuring that? How are you measuring whether and how that happens? I don't know. And I don't know that any of you have a great answer for it. Some of you might have tried something creative in an alumni survey. I mean, but so I don't, I don't want to sound like, but systematically, we've, we've made no effort to measure that. But we can. I mean, you could measure it on an activity level. You know, have you read a book in the last month? Have you talked to somebody from a different country? Have you traveled? Have you, right? I mean, there's so many different ways you can measure it at an activity level. You could also measure it at an emotional level. So it turns out one of our best questions in the world for whether you're thriving in your well-being, one of the questions that underpins that is this statement, I learn or do something interesting each day. Isn't that nifty? I learned to do something interesting each day. I was really excited because when I realized that was one of our key questions that we've asked all over the world and all over the US, I was like, oh, I bet there's awesome data in there that shows the value of a college degree, right? So we go digging in. There's no difference in the likelihood that someone strongly agrees to that by educational level until you get to postgraduate. So for bachelor degree holders, there's no difference at all, not a single, single point. It's a statistical tie between bachelor degree holders, high school only, and even below high school. Now, there is, so by educational attainment, you don't get a pop until postgraduate. And it actually is a pop for people who have started or finished postgraduate work. And you know what I think is going on here? I think that's actually, those are innate learners. As opposed to people who were trained to be lifelong learners. This is just my own personal kind of view and critique of it. But it's an example of, one, we don't have much evidence to measure this at all. And the tiny evidence that I have through the lens of this one question that I'm using, it doesn't look great, except for those who go on to postgraduate studies. Where there's huge variance in the likelihood that you strongly agree to that is by the type of job you have. So this is analysis we haven't even shared yet. I have 14 major classifications of work group types in the US that I was able to break this data by. Here's, here's the top by work category in terms of the highest likelihood of saying I learn or do something interesting each day. You ready? Installation or repair worker or mechanic, number one. Number one, don't judge a book by its cover. Number two, physician. Okay, kind of makes sense. Doctors uh, right at the top of the list. Number three, farming, fishing, and forestry. Number four, construction or mining worker. Number five, teacher. 
Glad to see teacher towards the top of the list. We'd be disappointed if it wasn't. Number six, business owner. Number seven, manager or executive. Number eight, transportation worker. Number nine, professional worker. Number 11, service worker. 13, uh, 11, 11 is other. Uh, 12 is sales worker. 13, uh, four, okay, guess here, here this, is, this is unbelievable. Second to last place is nurse. And dead last is uh, clerical or office work. Huge variance. No variance by educational level except post-grad. Huge variance across what you do for work, which is something to think about. So I give you those examples to just say that I don't think we've clearly defined uh, what we mean by certain things like critical thinking when we go out there and use those as powerful. And, and by the way, that resonates a lot. When you say, what's the liberal arts, and you start to describe it, what resonates with people is critical thinking, skilled communication, collaboration, culture, and all that resonates. The descriptors resonate much more than the words. So we haven't clearly defined some of these things. And then the other categories, we just flat out haven't even measured them, like lifelong learning. We've made very little attempt to do that, and I think there are some very fruitful ways that we can pursue that. So now let me just finish on the point of improving, and then we're going to open it up to conversation. Um, you say, okay, well, Brandon, what's your recommendation for improving liberal arts? I mean, one, I would tweak the sales, marketing, and branding. You've heard me on that point. Two, the essence of it is as powerful and relevant as it has ever been. So we stick to our guns on that. But the improvements, and I've hinted at them, are the one that jumps out in our data is having a work integrated experience with your learning. And that can come in so many different forms, whether you call it co-op, apprenticeship, you call it internship. It's a job where the faculty member goes, hey, what are you doing for the summer? And you go, oh, I'm working at Burger King, and whatever the example is where you think there's no learning that can be had from that. Guess what? If I work with you, I'm sure we could come up with a lot of really fascinating examples of what I could learn, even working in something like a fast food restaurant. Just, we just got to be a little creative and imaginative. I always use the example of a supply chain management course, right, and trying to figure out how the meat got to your grill. I mean, that's a really provocative. I was, I, my, my joke is it's a flippant example. Get it? We can, I have zero, thank you. I knew I'd bring you back. I knew I would bring you back. Thank you. It's a funny example, but it's also a real one in that this is also what the students do to take advantage of this, right? Like, we think we've got a job that's just a boring job over the summer. Let's figure out how to draw learning out of it. And oh, by the way, we can do this programmatically. I mean, one of the things that I benefited from in this program called the Heart Leadership Program in my public policy studies was I had a spring semester preparatory course for a summer opportunity in leadership followed by a fall reflection course about that experience. It was a year-long, integrated, academic, exper experiential program that was, I had to do it. It was part of the program. We can do it programmatically, we can encourage students to think about it, and we can encourage individuals if I can do it. Now here's another simple example of how low the bar is, how easy it is to move the needle on these indicators. If a student or graduate had a single conversation with a staff or faculty member about their career, it boosts them on almost every indicator of things like saying their degree was worth the cost, they had a high quality degree, the likelihood they had a good job waiting for them, right? So the big message to go back to faculty is you have no idea, really, how important and powerful and lasting your impact is. That's my message to faculty. Liberal arts faculty are the highest because their students and graduates are the highest on the relationship rich indicators that matter almost more than anything that we've been able to look at. Made me excited about learning, cared about me as a person, mentor who encouraged my goals and dreams. The message we need to send to our liberal arts faculty is that you matter a lot and the impact you have is serious and lasting. And it's not just in you know, a couple dimensions, we're talking about all the different dimensions we're looking at here. Work, life, whatever it might be. And the bar is low, having just a single conversation with a student about, hey, what are you thinking about doing? And guess what? We can all draw examples. I think about some of the best courses I had. The best course I ever took in leadership was all based around Shakespeare. The entire course was taught from Shakespeare. The professor happened to be amazing. But guess what? Shakespeare became incredibly relevant in modern day leadership challenges and experiences. And gosh, you know, you all have had an example of that in coursework that you've had. But there's a lot of the magical ingredient in there. That magical ingredient was that professor. Shakespeare helped. The professor was the really amazing part. 
So, uh, so here's where I end. Um, I don't know that we need to have a new name that we all agree upon. Uh, I think you can, instead of saying we're a blah, blah, blah liberal arts institution, I think you can, you can come up with a number of descriptors at work, right? And I've mentioned some of these things, critical thinking, skill communication, collaboration, but I think we need to have some different words that we describe in the headline. But I'll tell you something that's been testing and resonating really well. I'm gonna put out there as a suggestion. You guys can reject it, give it a zero or a 10, <laughs> fine by me. What I think a liberal arts education is, is it's a universal education. Like a universal donor. It can be applied, and if we do it right, it should be applied to anything. A challenge in my personal life to how do I do better in my job? and everything in between. If we deliver on its full promise, and if we deliver on its intent, going back to its ancient roots, it's essentially a universal education. It's a universal degree. And so that's one thing, as an example, that's testing very highly. You put that in front of folks and they go, oh, it's, it's not just a, you're not just getting training for a specific job, We've all used this in our description, right? When you talk about the value of liberal arts, I've heard every college president of a liberal arts institution say this. We're not just training you for your first job, we're training you for your last one, meaning your career, or this isn't just about specific training for a job, it's about being prepared for anything. In a world of artificial intelligence disruptions that are facing us in many industries, right? This is about preparing people for anything that faces them. It's a universal education. It can go in any number of directions. And oh, by the way, it's not an either or, right? So the final point I'm gonna land on is that we need to think about how we do this across the board. I think this is true in STEM. This is true in vocational and technical training. I want to see important aspects of the liberal arts in vocational and technical training, just as much as I wanna see real hard skill elements woven into the liberal arts. And this is just one simple example, but you talk about great stories about the liberal arts out there, it's liberal arts graduates who come out with coding experience. I mean, there's just one narrow, thin slice. It's a hard skill, coding, combined with the ability to think in very interesting and divergent and new ways. We can do this. We can do this, and we have done it because you see it in the data. Liberal arts graduates who had a job or internship doubles their odds of having a good job waiting upon graduation. Also puts them on par with earnings of STEM and engineering graduates. So there are some ingredients that we can improve upon. Um, and hopefully, I've given you guys a few things to think about, some new information and tools to use. By the way, almost all this data, with the exception of the um, lifelong learning by uh, industry stuff is, is stuff that I can point you to. Articles we've published, reports we've published. Uh, so it's all material you can use. But um, I'm interested in your reactions, your questions, and, uh, and thanks so much for, for having me be part of the day. Thank you. Yes, I can hear you and I'll repeat the question if it's, they want you to say it, okay. Hi, Brandon. So I love the idea of a universal education. As I think about it from the perspective of the science of learning and where we might go, we recognize that transfer is domain specific, right? The work of Erickson and many others over and over that it's one of the hardest things, the holy grail in education, is to transfer what you've learned in one disciplinary context to another. You know, I might be great at solving genomics problems, probably not so good at analyzing a 17th century French literature piece. We've made some progress, I think, with the AAC and U value rubrics, with trying to do things that cross domains, and yet we still are assessing that work within the context, each piece of a specific domain. What might we do as a group in terms of advancing a research agenda to actually demonstrate that what one learns in a liberal arts context is transferable? Because I, I may be missing it, but I don't think we have the hard evidence to back the claim. 
Well, you're right. I mean, I think we, we, uh, I mean, we need more hard evidence, right? And the need for that hard evidence is not going away. It's one of my key four points, right? Um, the need to prove it. Uh, so there's a couple things. Either we say that it, it's there and we just haven't looked at it in our existing data, which, I mean, there's a sliver that we could probably extract from that. Um, or it's we need to measure and assess new and different things. And that's really where I think the biggest breakthroughs are going to be. Now, that said, you know, you, you look at some of the critiques of higher education as an organization. I always joke that it studied everything except itself. And, you know, when we get really honest about this, right, um, I can't believe that there aren't already, just like hospitals have done for a couple decades now, a whole bunch of co collaborative, across institution, learning labs, controlled studies. I mean, I'm talking like learning control, control studies, right? And uh, testing different types of, we'll call them educational interventions, pedagogies, whatever you might want to put in that language, right? We've all done pilots of the new program. And, but, but, you know, you think about it. How did, how, did, uh, how did we make a lot of breakthroughs in cancer treatment and things like that? Multiple hospitals collaborated in research design and approaches where the combination of learning from multiple hospitals actually gave us really big insights there. Um, so... Yeah. They're, you're, they're coming together. I mean, I think that, you know, they, they're going in the right direction, right? Then the question becomes how visible are the outputs from that, right? Like, and, and, you know, and that becomes really challenged. And then if we do find some really dramatic breakthroughs, uh, how ready are we to actually adopt them? You know, everybody loves to have the invented here thing. Like, we, we think we're a best practice industry. We're really not. We just want to promote what we do. And, you know, do it a little differently than somebody else. And, you know, there's a lot of that out there. So, but, but in general, so yeah, those are examples that I think are definitely going in the right direction. But I think we could just amp that up in a really big time way. And it, it seems to me that higher ed of any organization, any industry could figure out how to collaborate on a bigger scale. I also see promising examples like the University Innovation Alliance. It's less about, you know, kind of learning strategies and learning outcome evaluation, much more focused on retention and graduation rates of underrepresented minorities. Um, but they're making some real breakthroughs because they've got a huge data set across 11 very large public universities. Um, those are the kinds of collaborations also, by the way, that are getting funded by major foundations. So if you're looking at uh, things that might be inspiring grant proposals or funding proposals to donors, I think, I think a lot of people would be interested in those kinds of things. Um, but it gets to several of the points we've all brought up, right? How do you codify the things that are learned? Um, and I just think about, uh, you know, some of the things we described, like if I said, what's been the most transferable thing from my experience, it was memo writing, policy memos. And so what did we do? The assignment was like, read 19 books on XYZ of environmental policy and give me a one page memo on what I need to know. And you're like, oh, I would have read, rather written a hundred page paper on that, right? But the, the impossible thing was to boil that down into one page. Guess what? That has transferred to every day of my life since then. How do you take a whole ton of information and boil it down into something that is like, what's the decision I'm going to make or what's the recommendation? I mean, I, it's, it's, it's been applicable in every day. So the good news is I think we can all come up with examples of that. I think we just haven't done a very good job of, of putting some hard quantification on that, but it can be done. I mean, if it's been done in the medical practice, I mean, these are examples. This is not, we haven't done it yet kind of thing. It's something that higher ed needs to really invest more in. So hopefully I've given you a bit of an answer. Yes. So um, sort of a low level question, but maybe it leads to a higher one. As I listened to you, I, I, I heard you regularly reduce liberal arts to arts and humanities yeah. and oppose that to STEM. Um, and, and you talked to us about rhetoric and about language and about branding. And I wondered if in doing that, you were reflecting the sense of what the broader public does of thinking of STEM education as perhaps not having arts and humanities or the degree to which, for you, liberal arts really was a synonym for arts and humanities education? Yeah, more, more a synonym. But I mean, we, so in the reporting of this, uh, and, and you notice I use different categories. In some of our studies, we've, we've reported different archetypes in terms of majors, right? In some cases, we've called it STEM. In other cases, we've literally broken out social sciences, sciences, right? All those sorts of things. We're getting enough data now. This is where it's going to get exciting. It's a great question, where we can actually get much more nuanced cuts where we can look at things like math majors, right? And other elements, right, that are underneath all the pieces of some of the classical categories that people would lump into those things. So 
part of it's a challenge in how we can cut the data, but we have all the labels and now that we're getting larger data sets, we're going to be able to look at some of those nuances. Um, so, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's fair. It's, it's good to hear you're just reflecting that back to me as well. So. And then as you focus, continue to focus um, on majors as you're cutting that, right, and, and where pe people do it or the context, um, the degree to which majors are actually serving as the right proxy for thinking about the kind of education that many of us would call yeah. liberal arts education as opposed to the depth, breadth, et cetera. Yeah, so and I think you're right. I, I don't think that majors are serving as a great proxy. They're increasingly less so. And it's why I brought up some of the nuances of, you know, um, in, the, you know in the categories we broke out, seeing some of the uh, arts and humanities majors higher than social science, science majors, others, if they just had an internship, right? I mean, the key ingredient there was not what your major was. The, the bigger mover in those outcomes was whether you had a job or an internship experience. And so um, I do think that, you know, we're going to see a lot of, or we should and could see a lot of changes in how we define majors. Um, I mean, some of you saw Jeffrey Sedlingo's post, uh, what, a few weeks ago about like the end of majors as we know it. There's some provocative thinking about this. There's also, I, I've been consulting with a couple of universities that are thinking about um, uh, eliminating departments. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you feel good about it? You endorse that, how it's going? Well, I have to live with the liberal arts because we have only a BA in the liberal arts. We have a master's program as well. But um, to the degree that people have been in the place of adding, adding, adding majors and trying to figure out how to, yeah. to take that out, it's going to be a disruption of what the working world is going to be doing in terms of training. Yeah. I would play to the top. Yeah. Well, that's why I kind of like making the case of a universal education. That should underpin everything, right? You could just call that the core experience with some domain expertise layered onto it. And that's another way of thinking about, you know, can the liberal arts become essentially the intel inside of all of higher education? I, I could make that case. Again, another analogy I'm testing. I don't know. We'll see how these things go. But, um, but the idea of it's a universal education, that would be the underpinnings of everything where you layer in on top of that universal education some very specific domain or skill expertise. That's, a, that's an interesting way of thinking about it, but uh, yes. It's a good follow-up, but in the data, when you say liberal arts graduates leap up double if they have a, quote, internship or job, uh, do, did your questions include academic civic engagement, practicums? clinicals, service learning, or does internship have a particularly narrow meaning in your data? That's what I'm wondering. The exact phrasing of that question, so we've asked uh, on a few of those dimensions, um, we, we ask about uh, number of hours volunteering, we, you know, a, a number of those things. We've asked about long-term project that took a semester or more to complete. Uh, the specific question that I referred to was a job or an internship where I applied what I was learning in the classroom. Now, separately, we asked, did you have a paid job during college? That has no relationship with anything. But, so the nuance is important because it gets to some of the nuances in Nessie high impact practices, right? It's not, just, it's not just, did you have a job? A lot of us had a paid job in college. Not many of us felt like we were able to apply what we were learning in the classroom in that job. And that's where, again, the onus is on both the student and all the different assets of the institution to increase the probability of that, but I, it becomes a qualitative measure rather than just did you have one. And it's much the same thing with extracurricular involvement. So if you look at all the different extracurricular activities that students could have been involved with, they have very little, if any, relationship with outcomes later. The statement that really does is a separate statement. I was extremely involved in an extracurricular activity or organization. Now that's, that's different because a lot of people check off a bunch of boxes and don't say extremely involved. Usually the ones, it's interesting, who, who say extremely involved, they had one or two things they checked off the box that they were involved in. Now, this is not me discouraging students from exploring things and trying different things, but it is me saying I worry that we've emphasized the pad the resume sequence at the cost of being deeply, meaningfully, lastingly engaged in any one thing. So um, it's about intentionality, too. That was a big word that jumped out as Jillian was talking. I mean, we have to be intentional. Like, yeah, we offer internships. Okay, for how many students? And then if you go out and interview those students, how many of them say they thought they were able to, you know, apply what they were learning? Well, all of a sudden, you know, those percentages get smaller and smaller and smaller. 
But if we're intentional about it, like as the example I gave in my heart leadership program, I, could, I couldn't have possibly missed the mark on that. If I had missed the mark on that, that was my fault, <laughs> right? I don't, uh, is it, who is Mike or, I wanna make sure I'm, yeah, go ahead. Hi, David Scobie, <clears throat> bringing theory to practice. Um, uh, thank you for this. It was really illuminating in all kinds of ways. One of the takeaways I, I, I have about, about how to intervene, what to do next, isn't in addition to your advice about building work integrated learning experiences and building intense engaged relationships is um, building experiences in which students reflect forward about the meaning of, yeah. so it might be yeah. that the e-portfolio is as important a practice as the conversation uh, with, with right. the, the teacher. What, yeah. what started me thinking about it was the 27% who, th who, that's the limit of who people who think their learning actually pr seriously prepared. The, I can't remember the, the uh, courses relevant to their work and uh, things I learn applicable in my day-to-day -day life. I'm totally confident yeah. that, that if, if we were looking at their life or engaged them in conversation, that number would go way up. But we haven't prompted students or created right. scaffoldings for them to think forward about how is what I'm doing and going to inform? Yeah, I think that's a huge point because it's, it's such, a, I don't want to say simple as in like super easy, but it, it is a relatively simple thing to do, is how can we make sure the synapses fire between the learning and the relevance, right? And I think that's, I was talking to a professor the other day that talks about prompts. And, you know, he was saying that, you know, anytime we talk about something that's a little bit theoretical, he said, I always pause and go, now, let me tell you how I think this is going to apply. And it's just that simple. He said it's not a very long part of it. It's not like it's in the syllabus. It's just little prompts, little, you know, kind of toggles between what I'm studying now and how this might apply, projecting or forecasting in the future, which is why I also think, you know, so you're right. I think there's several examples. Get at it. The one question that, you know, relates to it is, did anybody talk to you about your career? Well, that was a moment where somebody was like, what are you thinking about doing? And, oh, that's interesting. Maybe you should think about this or that. So uh, I think there are really empowering examples that are relatively easy to do that everybody can do. I mean, we don't need to train anybody formally on that, but to say, hey, are there any kind of little, you know, prompt points or, you know, kind of synapse connections where you can kind of connect the dots between something that might seem not applicable and then you go, oh, I never realized that actually is how a plane flies and I, you know, whatever the example is, right? So um, I think that's a great point. Thank you for reinforcing that. Thank you. Thanks so much.